sponsoring this event tonight. I would like to say that probably my greatest achievement is to be a lover of the Ahl Bayt and a follower of Imam Mahdi and inshallah Allah ta'ala Fajram Sharif. That that's the most important qualification for getting up here and speaking tonight, inshallah. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan al-ba'in al-rajim. Wa bismillahi ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi alladhi la shariqa lahu fi khalqa wa la shadiha lahu fi azamah. Wa alhamdulillahi alladhi hadana li hadha wa ma kuna li nahdili lawla al hadana Allah. والصلاة والسلام على المصطفى المعمود حبيب قلوبنا وحبيب قلوبنا وحبيب نفوسنا وشفيع ذنوبنا عبد القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم وبسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الشهر رمضان الذي أنزل أنزل فيه القرآن خذ للناس وبينات من الخذ والفرقان صدق الله العلي العظيم اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد. My lecture tonight, the rest in shallow will be in English, is about the relationship of the month of Ramadan and the hidden Imam Al-Qa'im al best Al-Mahdi, may Allah hasten his reappearance. <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in his blessed Quran, the month of Ramadan <laughs> is that in which the Qur'an was revealed, a guidance to men, and clear proofs of this guidance and of distinction, the Qur'an. When we talk about the month of Ramadan, the month of fasting in Islam, <coughs> most of us like to limit the purpose of Ramadan to be one of getting a little hungry, and getting a little thirsty to feel for the poor and to remember the less fortunate for one month. But this is not the true purpose of the month of Ramadan. This is an important effect, but this effect does not last because if we truly felt for the condition of the poor, and the needy, and the helpless, and the weak, then every day would be like a day in Ramadan all year long, and there would be no poor people in the Muslim world. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, has said in the Qur'an that He revealed this Qur'an in the blessed night of Laylatul Qadr. The most important thing about Ramadan is the fact that the essence of the Qur'an was revealed in its entirety to Muhammad al-Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this Qur'an was meant to be a guidance for mankind. And it contains clear proofs. Clear proofs. al bayyinati meaning things that people can understand. Clear proofs and a guidance and a furqan, something which distinguishes truth from falsehood. Thus, Ramadan marks the beginning of the final phase of guidance for all mankind. Ramadan symbolizes the abrogation or ceasing of all the previous messages, of all the noble messengers, and all the heroic efforts to permanently be superseded by the message of Islam 
and to be permanently carried on by the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt. Peace be upon them all. Thus we see that the month of Ramadan is the month which marks the revival of guidance, not only for mankind, but for all the jinn. This project is bigger than just us in this room. There are jinn here tonight listening to this lecture. There are jinn, there are angelic forces. There are all sorts of spiritual creatures besides human beings which have benefited from this Qur'an and who seek guidance from our Imams, it's not just us. And the Qur'an is the basis of the guidance as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said in this beautiful verse from Surah Al-Baqarah. So first, we should appreciate the closeness of Ramadan and the Qur'an. Now, everything in our lives needs revival because human beings by nature are in a state of entropy, which means we're always slowing down, we're always decaying, we're always falling apart. Everything, anything that has to do with construction, with building, with elaboration requires effort. If you do nothing, you will die. Only only uh, water, still water, uh, if, you know, does not contain life. Anything which is moving is full of life. Therefore, human beings periodically need revival. We need to renew our social contract and our commitment to the Ahlul Bayt and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent us the month of, uh, of Muharram. And we need to revive our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and He has sent us the month of Dhul Hijjah and the, the making of the pilgrimage. And He has asked us and allowed us and given us the chance to renew our relationship to the Qur'an in the month of Ramadan. So Imam Muhammad al-Baqir alayhi salatu wasalam, he says everything has its spring. Everything has its spring. And the spring here means the, the season of renewal. He says everything has its spring and the spring of the Qur'an is Ramadan. The spring of the Qur'an is Ramadan. This is the month in which the Qur'an becomes fresh for us again. It becomes new for us again. The angelic forces guide us even more than normal in this month. Allah sends down so many blessings in this month. He opens up our hearts, He fills our heart with light, and He makes it easy for us to take guidance during this month. And that's why this month is such a special month for us, and why we, we should not let it pass by. We should not allow this month to become the month of feasting instead of the month of fasting, or the month of watching the latest uh, telenovel or serialization on TV instead of reading the greatest story ever told, which is the Qur'an. Now, to understand the Qur'an properly, we need a guide. It is true that the Qur'an itself explains itself. And the Qur'an needs to be properly interpreted with other verses from the Qur'an. But Allah explains elsewhere in the Qur'an that He has made some verses clear and He has made some verses not clear to the average reader. And we have many, many hadith which explain that there are, there are numerous interpretations of each verse that are uh, superficial or manifest and there are other interpretations which are hidden or esoteric in nature. And in order to understand the proper meaning of a particular verse in a particular time for a particular people, one has to have the totality of this knowledge of the hidden meanings and the manifest meaning, the original meaning and the future meaning. And only the Ahlul Bayt have this meaning, have this, have this knowledge. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, 
a book of which the verses are made plain, an Arabic Quran for a people who know. Nikomi Ya'lamun, for a people who know. Elsewhere he says in the Quran, and we did not send it down before you to any but men to whom we sent revelation. So ask the Ahlul Dhikr, ask the people of remembrance, if you do not know. So you see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is commanding us in the Qur'an itself. Again, Allah says, this Qur'an will guide you. And this Qur'an is guiding us. Where? To the Ahlul Dhikr, to the people who remember. لِقَوْمَ يَعْلَمُونَ To the people who know. I was reading online the other night, a interpretation of this noble verse of the Quran, which says, "Fasalu ahlul dhikr in kuntum la ta'lamun." Ask the people of remembrance if you do not know. And Subhanallah, the exegete, the interpreter of this verse, said that the ahlul dhikr are the ahlul kitab, are the Christians and the Jews. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. That he would say, this, this verse does not refer to the Ahlul Bayt. Allah is telling us in the Qur'an, if you do not understand the Qur'an, go ask the people who don't know about your Qur'an. I mean, subhanAllah. Do you see how when you don't have the guidance of the Ahlul Bayt, when you don't benefit from the light of these holy personages, how you fall into error about the simplest thing. If this interpreter of the Qur'an had read a few more verses, he would have understood what Allah's opinion was of the Ahlul Kitab. If we needed to ask them about our religion, Allah would not have brought a new religion. He would have told the, the Arabs of the peninsula to become a Christian or a Jew. So we see the importance of having a, a proper guide. Having people we can rely on who, as it says in the Quran, believe in everything, believe in all of it all of it that was revealed, and they don't have a doubt for one second. Not for one second did they ever doubt it. If you look, if you look at the lives of the companions of the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if you look at the people who were called the Rashidun, if you look at the Sahaba, you will see how many times they doubted the message. How many times they, they questioned it. After the battle of Uhud, when the Prophet of Allah وسلم, was struck, when the Muslims thought that he had been killed and received a fatal blow, some of these Sahaba, which were later called Rashid, rightly guided, had run so far away from the battlefield that it took two days for them to walk back to Medina when they found out that the Prophet had not been fatally injured. Even one of the Sahaba had said, if, when, when the news of the Prophet's death was announced in Medina, he said, if anybody says he has died, I will cut off his head. And one of his, one of his friends had to remind him of the verse of the Qur'an which says, Muhammad is a man like any other. If he dies, would you turn your back on your religion? So how can the people who have doubted the Qur'an, who have had questions in their minds, the people who had to be corrected by old women because they did not even know the rules of menstruation, these people could never be the Ahlul Dhikr, they could never be the people of remembrance. They could not be the Qawmi Ya'lamun, the people who know. The people who know, the people of remembrance, are the Ahlul Bayt. And this is an incontrovertible fact. This is the fact which is completely undeniable. Again, if we just look at Hadith of Thaqalain, the Hadith of the two weighty things, narrated by all of the narrators of Hadith, Sunni and Shia, unanimously, in which, in the final pilgrimage, the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Truly I am leaving behind you two precious things, the thaqalain, the two heavy things. Thaqal means something which is heavy, could be physically heavy or weighty and important. 
He says, I'm leaving two weighty things, the thaqadain. The book of Allah, Kitab Allah, and my itra, my descendants, my progeny, my Ahlul Bayt. For truly the two will never separate until they come back to me at Kotha. At Kotha, the heavenly pool which we will all gather around, inshallah, on the Day of Judgment. So Allah, uh, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was commanded to tell people that these two things, Qur'an and Ahlul Bayt, are inseparable. In fact, one of the meanings, one of the interpretations of the noble verse hold firmly to the rope of Allah, the Hablullah, refers to the, to the Ahlul Bayt. Because the Ahlul Bayt and the Qur'an are intertwined. They're, they're like twines in, that make a rope. If you separate, you can't say, I'm going to open up half the rope. You're going to unravel the whole thing and you have nothing. If you have the Qur'an without the guidance of the Ahlul Bayt, you get extreme interpretations. If we look at the political violence which is occurring in the Muslim world today, in the name of Islam. You see that the vast majority of this violence is being committed by Muslims who have not benefited from the knowledge of the Ahlul Bayt. And that may be one of the reasons why their interpretation of the Qur'an is so skewed. This is a serious matter, separating the Qur'an and the Ahlul Bayt. This is not just a arcane discussion for the scholars to have sitting in a masjid after prayers. The whole fabric of our society, the establishment of justice, the distribution of khums, making war and peace, the rights of women and children in society, all this depends on a proper understanding of the Qur'an. The path of spirituality, the true path of irfan, which leads to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not to some devilish influence. This depends on a proper understanding of the inner meaning of Islam and the outer meaning of Islam. Imam Ali alayhi salatu wasalam said in a very famous hadith, he said, you should know that all the secrets and the mysteries of the divine books are contained within the Holy Qur'an. And whatever is in the Holy Qur'an can be found in the Surah Al-Fatiha, the first chapter of the Qur'an. And then he says, whatever is found in Surah Al-Fatiha is contained in the verse, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. And he said, whatever is found within Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim can be found in the Ba of Bismillah. And he said, whatever is found within the Ba of Bismillah is contained within the Nukta, the dot beneath the Ba. For those of you who don't uh, read Arabic, Ba looks like a little boat with a dot under it. So the, so the, the dot under the Ba is the essence of the Ba, which is what makes the letter Ba a letter Ba and not another letter. So he says everything that's contained in the Ba of Bismillah is contained within the little dot beneath the Ba. And then Imam Ali said, I am the dot. I am the dot beneath the letter Ba. So there is no doubt, there is no doubt in our mind that Shah Ramadan, the month of Ramadan, is the month of the Quran. And the Quran is the book of guidance. And in order to understand this book to be guided, we need a guide. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent the Ahlul Bayt one light after another to be the proper interpreters of the Qur'an. Now, we said that Imam al-Baqir said that everything has its springs. So what is the spring of man? What is the thing which revives man ultimately? What is the thing which revives human society and the hope of human society? It is the intidhar, the waiting, for Imam al-Mahdi, may Allah hasten his reappearance. In fact, Imam Musa al-Kadhim alayhi salatu wasalam said, Intidhar al-Muntadhar 
waiting for the awaited one itself is part of the faraj. Waiting for the relief of the imam is part of the relief that you experience. So the fact of waiting itself is part of the faraj, is part of the relief that we will experience. So what is the relationship between the month of Ramadan and the holy imam? Because perhaps you're thinking, oh, Sha'ban is the month of Imam Mahdi. May Allah he send his reappearance. Because that's the month that he was born in. And that's the month that we celebrate his birthday. This is true. This is true. But throughout this whole month we recite Dua al-Iftitah. And in this Dua, we could say that there are essentially four parts. The first is the praise of Allah. The second is the etiquette of asking Allah for things. The third is the praise and remembrance of the Ahlul Bayt. And the fourth and final part of Dua Iftitah is praying for the Imam and anticipating how society will change with his arrival and what part we are going to play in that society. So, Imam al Nahdi becomes the pivot, he becomes the crossroad between the impetus to understand and revive our knowledge of the Quran and to revive our hope for the Ahlul Bayt. So wherever you hear Qur'an, think Ahlul Bayt. Whenever you hear Ahlul Bayt, think Qur'an. And that is why in this noble month of Ramadan, it, you cannot separate the remembrance of Imam Mahdi as our current and living Imam from your remembrance and practice of Qur'an. So the next question, as we, as we like to say in marketing, is what's in it for me? What's in it for me? This is what's in it for you. As you know, the Imam is waiting for 313 believers. The same number that the Prophet of Allah وسلم, had at the Battle of Badr. And according to the narrations, amongst these 313 will be men and women. He's not just waiting for 313 soldiers. He's waiting for 313 true believers who have an absolute conviction. And then there is another group of 10,000 people, according to narrations, who will also be assisting him. So who does the Imam need to assist him? Who does the Imam need to assist him? He needs people who are strong brothers and sisters, but not who have physical strength. He's looking for brothers and sisters who have spiritual strength. For example, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala narrates the account of Badr in the Quran, He says, and Allah did certainly assist you at Badr when you were weak. But be careful of your duty to Allah, have taqwa, so you may give thanks. When you said to the believers, does it not suffice you that your Lord should assist you with 3,000 angels sent down? And if you remain patient and you remain on guard, they can come upon you in a headlong manner. And your Lord will assist you with 5,000 more of the havoc-making angels. And Allah did not make it, but is a good news to you, that your hearts might be easy and the victory be only from Allah. So you see, Allah is talking about Badr, He's talking about people who are so brave, who are facing where the odds were against them. But Allah assisted these people with the angelic hosts. He gave them spiritual hosts. He gave them the angelic guidance to support them in ways that were even beyond their wildest dreams. And this is how they became strong enough to defeat an army many times their size, which would, had superior armament. You see, the strength they had was not in their muscles, it was not in their weapons. It was the spiritual strength they had, it was the angelic assistance they had, it was the divine intervention to support them, which made them strong and amazingly powerful. Again, Allah says in Dua Aftitah, 
uh, he says, and send your blessings on the guardian of your orders, the one who will rise in Qa'im, al muntada the awaited one for the awaited justice, and surround him with your favorite angels, your choicest angels, and assist him with the Holy Spirit, Ruhul Qudus. This project is bigger than you and me, brothers and sisters. This project is bigger than us, but it starts with us. Because the angels don't need the Imam's guidance. They're already guided. And the jinn don't have a physical body to go through the same types of temptations that we suffer. So this project is depending on us, but we're not the sole factor. But until, until we cleanse our hearts, until we rarefy our understanding and our practice of Islam, there's no room for the Imam to manifest himself. There's no place he can go where he will truly have the help that he needs. There was a narrate there's a narration from the time of Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq alayhi salatu was salam. He was at Mina. He was at Mina at the end of Hajj. And one of his companions came to the Imam and entered the tent with him. And he said, MashaAllah Imam, see how many Muslims have come to make the Hajj. And the Imam said, the Imam closed the flap of his tent and he said, let me show you how many people's Hajj has been accepted by Allah. And he opened the flap again and the entire plain of Minna was empty, except for a few people walking around. You see, the reality is not in the numbers. The reality is in the purity of the hearts. How do we get this purity? This purity is an imperative, brothers and sisters. That's why in Dua Iftitah, and I, I, I implore the youth, I ask you, if you have not read this Dua, if you have not studied it carefully, please start studying it carefully. There's a great a site called Shia Mobile, and mashallah, these uh, brothers and sisters have done a great job putting Dua Iftitah and all the great Duas and all the Amal for free that you can download on your smartphone, on your iPad, on your whatever English translation, the Arabic, the recitation. It's never been an easier time in the history of being a Muslim to appreciate this. So what, is, what, is, what, has, what has the Imam taught us in this Dua? I should say for those of you who don't know that this Dua, Dua Al-Iftitah, was a gift from Imam Al-Mahdi. It was a present from the Imam, a goodbye gift from him to us, before his Ghaybat al Qubra, before the major occultation. He gifted this Imam, he gifted this dua to his final representative. This was like a placeholder of the Imam in his, in his major occultation until his return. So, what has the Imam taught us in this dua? Basically, this dua, dua al iftita, is an instruction manual. This is an instruction manual of how to prepare ourselves for the Imam's return. How to be the change that we want to be, as Gandhi said, for the Imam to come back. This is his instruction manual for you and me. He says, he taught, the Imam teaches us in this dua, through him, through the Imam, cleanse our chest, our sudur, our chest means our heart, our feelings. Cleanse, through him, through the Imam, cleanse our chest and remove the stains of anger and the hatred from our hearts. You see how beautiful this is, brothers and sisters? The stains of anger. When you are angry at somebody, when you harbor hatred and anger, there is a stain which develops on your heart. If your heart has a stain, it cannot reflect the light of Allah. It is a defective mirror. It is a rusty mirror. The goal of the Muslim is to polish his heart until it is smooth as glass and only reflects the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> Mawlana Jalaluddin Rumi, Mawlana has a story. He says, I went to the house of my beloved and I knocked on the door. And my beloved Dudus here means Allah. He says, I went to the house of my beloved and I knocked on the door and he said, who is it? He said, I said, it is I. He said, there's no room in here for you. And I went away. I came back later and I knocked on the door of my beloved and he said, who is it? And I said, it is you. He said, then come on in. 
So when we cleanse ourselves of ego, of hatred, this is personal hatred we're talking about, personal hatred. It is a virtue to dislike the things which Allah has disliked and to love the things that Allah has loved. This is a virtue, brothers and sisters. But personal hatred, this is a waste of your life. This puts years on your face. Hatred will kill you. Hatred is wishing that somebody would die of poison and swallowing the pill yourself. This is what hatred is. So the Imam says this is a stain on your heart to have anger and hatred. And the Imam is going to, for once, once and for all, cleanse this anger and hatred from the hearts of people. But the vanguard of the Imam, the people who will assist them, have to have already done this before he comes back. Because these are the types of people he's looking for. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, O Lord, forgive us and our brethren who came before us into faith, and leave not in our hearts rancor or a sense of injury against those who have believed. And Lord, you are indeed full of kindness and most merciful, Arufu Rahim. So in the Quran itself, we see the imperative to not have hatred towards the believers. We cannot function as a Muslim society if we hate each other, if we backbite, if we criticize, if we take the smallest difference in our approach to Islam and say, I'm not going to talk to him, I'm not going to talk to her. Brothers and sisters, we only weaken ourselves and we strengthen the hand of our enemies and we only delay the coming of the Imam with this type of behavior. We cannot be spiritually strong when we have hatred in our hearts. It weakens us. It weakens us. Again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, O oh, you who believe, if any from amongst you turns back from his faith, soon Allah will bring another people whom he will love and as they love him. You see, the basis of the relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is love, not fear. The true believers have a relationship with Allah based on love. And the love of Allah produces a love of the Ahlul Bayt. Because they are the means of Allah manifesting the mercy of guidance in this world. So again, the verse go, goes on. Allah is describing the people who He will bring to really do the job that the Muslims, the average Muslims, failed in doing. He says, Oh, you who believe, if any from amongst you turns back on his faith, it doesn't matter to Allah. How many faith... See, Allah is saying, I don't need a lot of believers. Do you think you're doing me a favor because a lot of you have become believers? He says, don't worry. If you leave the, my religion, I'll bring another people. I'll bring another people. I will love them and they will love me. They will be humble with the believers, but strong against the unbelievers. They will fight in the way of Allah, and they will never be afraid of the people who find fault with them. Who do you know who lived their life like this? Al-Imam al-Hussein. Al-Imam al-Hussein. Who had no fear against the people who belittled him. So sisters, do not fear the, the, the funny looks and the talks of other women who look at you when you wear hijab. Or brothers for having a beard, or for having a Muslim name, or for taking a break to pray on the lawn of your university. Allah says in the Qur'an that the honor exists, rests only with Allah. If you want to be honored, it will only come from Allah. So Allah says these are the people that He wants in His religion. <coughs> Humble with the believers, firm against the unbelievers, they fight in the way of Allah, and they never are afraid of people who, who reproach or find fault with them. This is the grace of Allah, ذَلِكَ فَضْلُ Allah, which He will bestow on whomever He pleases. This is the grace, brothers and sisters. Allah wants us to love, and He wants to love us. He wants us to conduct everything we do in our affairs 
with love. And this is the only way that the Imam will be able to come back when he has his lovers here to support him. So the things that we can start to do in this month of Ramadan and inshallah continue to do every month and every day until the next Ramadan when we renew our fervor again is to cleanse our hearts, to forgive those who have hurt us, to renew our bonds with the Muslims, and to pray for the Imam every single day. How many of you, you don't have to raise your hands, but just ask yourself, how many of you pray for your Imam every day? Because your Imam prays for you every day. Your Imam remembers you every single day. Imam al-Sadiq he said, Kullina, all of us Imams remember you. We all remember you. And there are narrations which say there is not a Shia, but if he pricks his finger on a rose, we feel grief for him. And if he has a fever, we pray for his health. <coughs> Can you imagine having an Imam who's so merciful and kind towards you, who remembers you every day? Allah says in the Qur'an that there are angels who are praying for you every day and remembering you every day. And the Imams have told us that they remember us every day. But how many of us remember our Imam every day? How many of us pray Dua al-Faraj? Or simply say, O oh Allah, hasten the appearance of the Imam. O oh Allah, give relief to the hidden Imam. How many of you send your salams to the Imam? Inshallah, if your answer was not every single day, from today onward, every day you will remember your Imam. May Allah bless us all. May Allah reward us all for coming together in this gathering. I'm so proud. I'm so proud of the youth that are here today. I'm so proud of the youth who set up this dinner and catered this dinner for you and had this beautiful arrangement of the tables and the chairs and the flowers and the slideshow and the beautiful arrangement of fruit. Yeah. Brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the youth. And the Prophet of Allah and the Imams, peace be upon them all, favored the youth. One of the greatest accusations that was leveled against the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his lifetime was that he was corrupting the youth. Why? Because he wanted the youth to be pious. He wanted the youth to help the poor. He wanted the youth to feel proud of themselves. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he The Prophet of Allah always placed a lot of trust in the youth. Do you see how much he taught about Ali alayhi salatu wasalam? How many responsibilities he gave to Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salatu wasalam? But it wasn't just Ali ibn Abi Talib who had a very special relationship. Just look at the case of Osama for example. Osama was a, a, a young boy, he was 17, 18, and as the Prophet was sick and lay with fever in Medina, he made Osama the head of the expedition that was to leave Medina with Abu Bakr and Umar and other Sahaba two and three times his age under his command. He said, you are under the command of Osama. Whatever he says, you do. This is how much trust the Prophet of Allah had in the youth. You see how valiantly the youth at Karbala sacrificed their lives from Ali Akbar to Qasim to Aum, all the other youth of the Ahlul Bayt, how brave they were to say, death to me is sweeter than honey. They couldn't wait to go out and express their faith and be a martyr, to be a witness of the truth of Allah and the truth of His religion and the righteousness of their holy family over all other families and over all other religions. Brothers and sisters, all we have in our lives are our progeny, our children. 
And if we plan to continue to live in this country, which is not a Muslim majority country, we must be prepared to support our youth, to encourage them, to create a forum, a place where they can explore and grow and appreciate the faith that you came to appreciate in your home country. You were a fish swimming in water. You grew up with this stuff that was so natural to many of you. But it is not natural or obvious to your children. They are a fish who has to live on land. And you brought them here. It was your decision to move here. It was your decision to stay. Now it must be your decision to support your children. I love working with the youth because they're full of hope. They're full of love. They're full of light. They're full of optimism. And they have boundless energy and they have a commitment to always do better and to always do good. So brothers and sisters, if you enjoyed the dinner tonight, if you enjoyed the setup, if you enjoyed the speech that I gave, please donate something to help support the youth group of the Islamic Educational Center of San Diego. Do we have people walking around? Yeah. Now? There? Okay. So I want the brothers and sisters to walk around and uh, they'll be coming inshallah and handing out forms. Brothers and sisters, I'm talking to the adults here. Please reach into your hearts and reach into your pockets and donate something today. Ten dollars, fifty dollars, a hundred dollars, five dollars, whatever you can donate. How valuable is the faith of your children? How valuable is the faith of your children? How much is it worth to you? I'm talking to the parents here. I'm a parent, I think as most of you know. I have four children. If you think about it, if you think about it, most of us, alhamdulillah, have been Muslims for many, many, many generations. Because we came from Afghanistan, Iran, Pakistan, India, North Africa, the Maghrib, where people have been Muslim for 500 years, for 1,000 years, for 1,300 years, for 1,400 years. Generation after generation, an unbroken chain of faith. This is the first generation, brothers and sisters, where the chain is going to be broken. And every single progeny that will come from your offspring, from now until the Day of Judgment, may never be Muslim again. Are you willing to, content, to condemn your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren to the hellfire? because you are not ready to give twenty dollars tonight to this youth group. This is the weightiness of this proposition. And this is not hyperbole, this is not just talk. Look at the Muslim countries that have been secularized. The chain has been broken. The chain of faith has been broken. Let's not risk the same problem here in this country. This is our chance to support the youth. So just ask yourself, how much is the fate of every generation that has come from my loins until the day of judgment worth to me? Is it worth a dollar? If it's worth nothing, don't give anything tonight. Don't give anything on any night. And watch your grandchildren not even know who the Imams are. Does that please you? Don't give anything tonight. I swear, I swear to Allah, I have met I have met the children and grandchildren of Friday prayer leaders from Iran. The children and grandchildren of great scholars who did not even know what an Imam was. The chain was broken, brothers and sisters. The chain was broken. And these people were lost in a sea of ignorance. Don't let that happen to your children. And don't let that happen to your grandchildren. Donate generously tonight and support the youth group. They do wonderful things. If we don't have this, where are your children going to go? Do you want to come up and say something? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> <laughs>
سلام علیکم ما جوان نیستم البته جوان دیروز هستم از این خاطر آمدیم امرای از اینا کمک کنیم شما ببینید بسیار افتخار آمید از جوان های اسلامی سرکر ما شما امی اسکول را که ما شما داریم امی اطفال را دست میتن کل از این امی جوان ها پیش میبرن به این خاطر از شما تفاظا میکنیم غیر از هم در تمام فعالیت هایی که اینجا حصه دارن و سبا همین مسجد اسلامی سنتر در دست زمین ها پیش میره انشاءالله فلی آزا امید است که اینا را کمک کنین از نگاه مالی تا دونی مالی شد خیلی شد و بتانن زیادتر را نقل بتانن و زیادتر کارای خود را پیش مبارد و خاطر نلیبی آن محمد سر آن